You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Baby Beginnings with your host, Stacy Bunyar. Stacy will assist moms, dads, and birth workers through the roller coaster of obstacles and emotions and to help plan for what lies ahead for you and your precious newborn. So please welcome the host of Baby Beginnings, Stacy Bunyar. Welcome to Baby Beginnings. Thank you for tuning into our show this week on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Stacey Bunyar, owner of Baby Beginnings New England here in Massachusetts. Today, we're going to talk about birth doulas. And if you're anything like my dad, the conversation is going to go a little like this. Uh, you're a do what? A doula. I <laughs> assist people during a birth. Oh, so you're like a midwife? No. <laughs> so we have Tara Campbell of Birthing Gently here today to tell us what a doula is. <laughs> Say hi, Tara. Hi, good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Tara, could you start us off by explaining what a, a labor or birth doula is? Sure thing. So a birth doula is someone that a couple seeks out and hires privately, typically, and it is a labor support person, so someone that the family is able to connect with outside of a hospital setting in their own environment and come up with a plan for their upcoming delivery and form a strong relationship, hopefully, and a strong bond with their doula. And that doula helps them to navigate the medical process, navigate the hospital, help them formulate a birth plan, and is on call for them 24-7. We don't sleep. And we arrive at the hospital when they go into labor, and we help them through their entire labor, making good informed choices and making sure that they're able to have movement in their labor and do the best thing that makes sense for them. And we stay with them the whole time. There's no shift change. And then we follow up with them after. Um, we do a postpartum visit in their home to make sure everyone's doing great. So it's a continuous emotional support, including information, education, and a lot of hands-on comfort measures for not only the mom, but also the partner and often the entire family. What inspired you to become a doula? So I feel like I've always been drawn um, towards birth, more so breastfeeding. Um, and growing up, I was always exposed to young kids and babies. And then when I was very young, I saw a giraffe be born, actually, which really inspired me. Um, <laughs> it's very odd, but when I look back at a lot of the memories, there's just all these little things that sort of pop out. So I've always been fascinated by the medical um, system, and I've just always been drawn to it in one way or another. So I just followed that, and I've always been um, working in the medical field in some capacity. So um, I started off about 16 years ago, and it hasn't stopped since. It's just continued to grow. Now, you've actually taken it one step further, and you are also a birth doula trainer for Donna, Dona International, correct? Yeah, so I've been a birth doula with Dona International for about 16 years, and I've also been a birth doula trainer for about 13 years. And so I travel all over the country, and I typically do about – two birth doula workshops monthly. Um, it's a great organization. It's one of the um, oldest organizations and it's international. So these doulas can go supporting women, you know, all over the world. And um, they're very reputable when a doula walks onto a labor and delivery floor and the staff hears that that doula was trained through Donut International. They know that that doula um, has a strong 
standards of practice and code of ethics. So um, they're pretty strict and it's just a wonderful, very supportive uh, organization. What does that training process look like for a person who would like to become a, a birth doula? So the nice thing about um, the birth doula process is it's fairly flexible in the sense that you can kind of go at your own pace. So if you have work, um, if you're, you know, if you have young children at home or you're a college student, that it's quite flexible. Um, You would take some in-classroom workshop, and that's typically three days. And then there's this big checklist of other items that you need to complete, which includes attending um, three deliveries in order to get your certification. So you need to be able to support at least three women on a labor floor. It does not have to be actually in a hospital. It could certainly be at a home. Um, So a home birth would count. Um, Maybe a cesarean section would um, be, you know, an experience that a doula trainee would um, have. So they're exposed to those three deliveries. They have to do some education with breastfeeding. They have to do some components with uh, some business. So there's a a big checklist, and typically it takes up to two years. I've seen people do it quicker than that, Um, but it's sort of self-paced, which is nice. I I think a lot of um, students appreciate the flexibility so they don't feel rushed, you know? Yeah. Is there a a childbirth education? I mean, are all these people becoming doulas already moms? Do they know about birth? So I have each class is just sprinkled with different backgrounds. I have some high school students um, that attend. I have some retired women that attend that are out of other careers completely. We have labor and delivery nurses. I've taught to medical students um, all over the country, and I've had I've actually had male doulas, which is awesome. I think that's a great thing. Um, and we call them doodlas. Um, so we've had male doodlas, we've had younger women. Um, so having children is certainly not a prerequisite to attend a birth doula training. Uh, in fact, some of the best doulas that I know do not have children themselves. So it certainly isn't a requirement. Now, do doodlas take it personally, just like mannies take it personally when you call them mannies? <laughs> not typically, <laughs> but... So it's funny because people will say, well, what makes them so interested in birth? Um, And it's almost all of the male doulas that I've trained have been um, involved in some sort of pregnancy-related care in some way. So I've had had several prenatal instructors that do fitness and, you know, like personal training whose clients got extremely attached and wanted them at their deliveries. And, of course, they knew nothing of birth, so they decided, oh, you know, I think I'll become a doula so that I can help support these women. And the ones that I still keep in touch with are actually quite successful. So it's really nice to see that um, and have that option available to people. That's amazing. About how many doulas have you trained? Uh, If I had to guess, and I really – I kind of thought about this the other day, but – I would say at least 7,000 at the, to this point um, over 13 years. So that's an, an incredible amount. So why do people not know what doulas are? I just don't think there's um, enough awareness as there should be. Although I, I will say that if I look back 16 years ago when I started, there certainly you know, was very limited awareness as to what a doula was. And I was always the one being asked, a doula, what's a doula? Are you a midwife? Um, You know, do you do deliveries at home? Are you an earthy, crunchy person? Do you not, are you anti-medication? And we would hear all of these things. And so it was like these little mini education sessions that we had to, you know, have with people. But now through social media and just more awareness and education um, and finally getting providers on board with this and they're, they're, there have been so many providers that have been super supportive of doulas, um, and they're referring their patients to us, which is great. So it's just spread. Um, it's not where I think it should be just available to everyone um, at every visit when they go in, that it's part of the conversation. It's, it's not there yet, but there's a big change compared to 16 years ago. 
Okay, we're going to take a short break. This is Stacey Bunyar on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. You're listening to Baby Beginnings. And when we return, we're going to talk about what the role of a doula looks like. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians. Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Le Colde Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit w- www.asmarart.com www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, you're listening to Baby Beginnings. I am your host, Stacey Bunyar. Before we went to break, we were getting to know Tara Campbell, founder of Birthing Gently. Feel free to check out her website at www.birthinggently.com. Um, Birthing Gently is a pretty large doula agency. Um, Tara, how many states does Birthing Gently serve? Um, so right now we serve Massachusetts, which is our hub, basically. We started in Boston, um, and that's our largest group. I have a small group in um, New, uh, excuse me, New York. I have a small group in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and North Carolina right now. Excellent. So, um, yep. So basically yeah. the states that I typically go to most um, to train is where I have a lot of uh, birth doulas available to people. Now, it, with your hub being in Massachusetts, do you also reach out to southern Maine and New Hampshire and things like that? Or do you pretty much just stay in the yep. Boston area? Um, right. We're typically in the Boston area, but we have clients all over. So we certainly have clients in southern Maine and southern New Hampshire in that area. So Absolutely. And what services does Birthing Gently offer? Are you just birth doulas? No, we're not just birth doulas. We offer birth doula support. We offer postpartum doula support um, for moms and families. We also offer lactation support. Um, So we have that side of Birthing Gently. And then the other side of Birthing Gently is the professional education side where we have the doula trainings. Awesome. Uh, And... So what does the birth doula do during a birth? Say I have no idea. (laughs) Sure. So our agency is a little bit unique because we typically work with high-risk women. So we're working with high-risk women with maternal or fetal conditions. So we work very closely with maternal fetal medicine practices in the Boston area. So our service in particular might look a little bit different, uh, maybe from some of the other doula services uh, across the country. So, you know, dealing with women that have um, serious medical conditions or perhaps a baby that also has um, a serious uh, medical condition or sometimes both of them. So ours is a little bit unique in that way. But I would say that the service itself, um, as far as sort of the, the process, is that we have our doulas go out and interview with families. Um, I always tell families that it's really important to interview more than one doula so that you can get a sense of different personalities and backgrounds 
and interview as many people as you feel you need to until you have that match. Um, and for some people, it's the first doula they know immediately. And you know that, Stacey, because you've been, you know, selected <laughs> immediately before you even leave the, the house. Um, <laughs> they're chasing you with contracts because you're fabulous. Right. But we also Thanks. have some doulas that, um, you know, it might take a little bit longer. And it's just personality. I almost feel like I run a dating service sometimes. I, I try to match people with the, you know, the right doula. So if it takes five uh, interviews, it takes five interviews. Once that doula has been selected the, and the family has decided to hire that person, um, they would move forward with uh, doing what we call a prenatal visit. Um, unlike the prenatal visits that you hear about when you go into your midwife or, uh, you know, obstetrician's office, this is a little different because we don't do anything medical. And this visit is done in the family's home. So we sit in their own space, in their own environment, and we really go over like a lengthy questionnaire asking about, you know, their fears, how do they deal with anxiety, how do they, um, you know, get a sense of control back if they're starting to spin, um, and what kind of relaxation techniques work well for them, any fears that they have about the upcoming delivery or concerns, and of course, we always ask the partner the same questions, um, and we might, you know, help them to formulate a birth plan, or we might talk about, um pain management, or we may practice some positions or acupressure points. So we spend probably a good three hours at that prenatal visit coming up with a, a, a plan um, for the upcoming delivery. Now, that plan needs to be very flexible and not so concrete because, as you know, you know, birth is very unpredictable and things can go many different ways. So we want a realistic, open-minded sort of approach. Um, Moving forward, we're on call for them 24-7 to answer questions by phone and text if they have any. Um, we attend the entire delivery. We stay with them up to two hours to provide immediate postpartum support. So, you know, if they're planning to breastfeed, we might help initiate that first latch. Um, and, again, we're still providing phone support um, to them through the first two weeks until we close the relationship at that postpartum visit that's done um, in their home around the end of the second week. That sounds like a lot. No, it is a lot. <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> that's the short version. I, I, I joke with clients sometimes and they say, you know, should I interview more than one doula? And I said, you know, we've all got the same bag of tricks, most likely, on how we're going to comfort you and support you during your birth. But try to pick a doula you want to be trapped in an elevator with. <laughs> so Exactly. That, you know. Some of our doulas, yep, some of our doulas are very soft-spoken. They're very motherly. They're very sort of calm, you know, uh, presence. And then I think you and I are pretty close match where we're like, let's go. We're doing three laps around the labor floor. We're going to come back here and try this. <laughs> A little bit more direct approach, and some clients like that, and others are horrified by that. So right. they need. You're right. We have the same bag of tricks. It's just the approach might be a little bit different. Ultimately, we should all be able to work um, with any client, and we do because we provide backup services to one another. So, and, and it's true. And and there's some connection when a mother picks you; they feel supported and safe with you. Um, and and so just to even know that going in that they're trusting you um, with their birth is huge, I think, for anybody. Absolutely. Yep. And I, you know, I have people ask, well, what do you actually do at the birth? Um, well, we help them to navigate sort of step by step as they move through the, the labor process. And, you know, oftentimes um, things are presented to a patient that may sound as if it's urgent when maybe, in fact, there's time for, you know, talking and negotiation or giving a little bit more thought rather than jumping right into something. Um, now, right. obviously, in a medical emergency or when it's really urgent, everyone's going to know because the energy in the room is um, much different. You know, there's no time for chatting. And we certainly don't step in and interfere with any of that. But we do help our clients to, to navigate the system and uh, make good choices for themselves uh, and making sure that all the options are presented, not just one or two. Uh, whether that's more invasive options or less invasive options, it's important that they're making good informed choices and not feeling pressured to, to make them quickly unless it's urgent. 
Yeah. I had somebody say to me the other day, oh, you're a doula, so you're a homeopath and not med friendly. And there's a stigma out there that us doulas are just spiritual, crunchy homeopaths. But really, there's a doula for everyone. Um, We need to take another quick break here at BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Stacey Bunyar. And next on Baby Beginnings, we're going to learn about gentle C-sections. Stay right there. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Thanks for hanging in there. This is Stacy uh, from Baby Beginnings. We are hanging out with Tara Campbell, a certified birth doula and instructor um, and owner of Birthing Gently. So we were just talking before the break about what a doula does in the birth room and uh, about hiring a doula. But um, can a doula be in the OR for a C-section? Good question, and a lot of doulas ask me this at the um, at the birth doula workshops, and certainly clients ask the same. I my response would say would be yes. However, it really comes down to the institution, the hospital, or um, often the um, the anesthesiologist who is making those decisions about who's in and out. Um, I think that if it's planned about ahead of time, so if you have a woman that is at really no risk for C-section other than the typical, um, so she's at no higher risk, that there needs to be some language if she's doing a birth plan and they're about in the event of a C-section, uh, what is most important to her. And talking about that, when she comes in uh, on the labor floor with her provider, that should this turn out that way, I really do want my birth doula in there. Uh, it's much easier when you're talking about a scheduled C-section because you're able to um, you know, have those discussions much further in advance. But I would say overall, yes. Um, and sometimes there needs to be a little bit more advocacy uh, around that from the patient herself. Um, so for the most part, our doulas do go in and we do a lot of work with C-sections and I'm in the operating room quite a bit. Yeah, I, I've t- attended quite a few C-sections myself. And I do find that if the client speaks to anesthesia directly instead of their nurse or instead of their midwife, they have a better response rate of letting the doula into the OR. Um, so kind of letting the client advocate to the um, anesthesiologist instead of the nurse that this is what they want it seems to make a big difference. Yeah, I think sometimes people don't realize, you know, who's who and um, who's in charge of different uh, aspects of the birth. But, yeah, I would say ultimately I would go straight for the anesthesiologist, whoever that might be, whether it's an attending or a resident, and just ask, you know, and it would be appropriate for the doula to have that conversation um, as long as it's not in any kind of confrontational way, um, you know, to go ahead and just ask if that would be okay if 
for example, it's more of an emergency situation and everyone's rushing around, the, the patient herself may not feel, you know, even be in the right mindset to be saying those things. So, yep, directing it, direct, uh, directing those questions to anesthesia is very important. Yep. Um, so now there's this thing popping up everywhere, the gentle C-section, the family-friendly C-section. What does that mean? Right. So there's a lot of language bouncing around, right, in regards to C-section. And um, you hear the word gentle C, family-centered C-section. Um, these terms just encompass sort of this approach of having a cesarean section that is a little bit more uh, family-friendly and enjoyable, I would say, from um, you know the patient's perspective. The surgical technique doesn't change, but it allows for the family to have a better experience. Um, and we work with a lot of C-section moms because we work with these high-risk uh, these high-risk uh, families. So, a few things are, are different. Um, this is something that is really quite popular in the UK and has just sort of moved forward here several years ago. Um, I've been very involved in this. And a few things that just jump out to me to give you a little bit more information would be things like putting the EKG leads that are on mom's chest on her back so that she has free space there for the baby. Um, maybe putting the IV in the non-dominant hand, allowing um, for a clear drape to be there. So if you think about watching you know, a birth video of a cesarean, you see this blue drape that separates the surgical field from the, um, from the mom, from the mom's uh, upper body, right? And she can't see anything. And when right. the baby's delivered, sometimes the obstetrician doesn't lift the baby up high enough and the poor mom is not any, unable to see her baby. And there were instances way back when I first started where I, I recall, um, you know, taking pictures of the baby and the mom would see the baby for the first time on my cell phone. And I thought, that's just really strange. So this is something that um, incorporating the clear drape allows the mom to actually see the delivery. Now, she can't see the surgical area, so she's not actually seeing the surgery. And I think some people get a little uh, freaked out by that. And so making that crystal clear is really important. Um, allowing the baby to come back to mom after it's been examined by the pediatricians in the operating room over at the baby warmer when the baby comes back typically you have this image of the partner holding this baby that's wrapped up like a baby burrito in the receiving blanket with a hat and although it looks cute it's much better for the mom and baby to be doing skin to skin so having the baby right on mom skin to skin sometimes we're doing breastfeeding in the operating room um, which is great so getting that all set up but you really do need a second set of hands so in order to, to navigate this. So some hospitals, you know, they can't uh, pay for an additional nurse to be in there. It certainly is an anesthesia's job to be doing this when they're, you know, strictly dealing with um, a lot of the anesthetic stuff. And the partner, you know, you know how this goes. Sometimes they, yeah. <laughs> they're a little wobbly, so we can't necessarily count on them for that. Um, it's an, un, you know, it's a very strange environment. So a doula there, it is much easier to get this uh, gentle C-section moving. Um, with an extra set of hands. There's not a lot of space to move around. We're kind of, um, you know, stuck back there with anesthesia in a very small space, but we make it work, and um, it's, a, it's a much better experience. And I can tell you professionally, I have something to compare it to because I've worked with uh, many family-centered C-sections now, and I've had four C-sections myself, and I was scared to death every time, and I wish this was an opportunity then, but it wasn't. So... Uh, it's a really great thing um, to be able to offer patients. Some hospitals are doing it, others uh, are not, and I think it's just going to take a lot of, um, you know, demand from patients coming in, and hopefully this will be a big shift, you know. We'll start to yeah. see this become standard practice. My third one was a C-section, and I really wanted um, to have this gentle cesarean uh, feeling in there. And they ordered the clear drapes, but somehow they never made it to the OR. But I did um, make a playlist that I was allowed to bring in, and they put on the speakers in the OR. And for me, that was everything, because at one right. point, I, I got that spinal headache. And the only thing that made me feel grounded is that I could close my eyes 
eyes and sing every word that I knew by heart and and, and just keep me on a level keel um, and, until it was over. So I really think it's great that ORs are coming around and, and making it a little less sterile for the parents and a little more welcoming. Um, we have to go to another commercial. Um this is Stacey Bunyar, Baby Beginnings. You're listening to BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We'll be right back. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. This is your host, Stacey Bunyar, and you're listening to Baby Beginnings on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Today, we're talking with Tara Campbell of Birthing Gently. You can reach Tara and learn about the doulas that work with Birthing Gently by going to www.birthinggently.com. Also, if you would like to ask Tara any questions during our show today, uh, you can call the station at 866-451-1451. Here's a question I hear a lot. It's how do doctors and nurses and most importantly, partners feel about having a doula in the room? Um, Well, partners definitely, I think, love us because we help them to, um, you know, work with their work with their loved one who's laboring. Often they're scared to death and they're not sure what they should be doing and they're not really sure what's normal and what's not. So sometimes as you know, um, people are making a lot of sounds during labor and movements that for some are very scary, but for us, we know are very normal and actually are great sounds and movements. So um, the partners typically really love the support and the guidance. Um, the nurses um, we work really well with, is, and again, the providers too. So, you know, the providers see the benefits and they, and they make the referrals for their patients who they think um, would benefit from a doula. And overall, I would say we all work together nicely as a team. Um, It's very unusual, although you hear stories. um, I think it's pretty unusual now um, that you would have any kind of, um, you know, relationship that would be adversary uh, in the room. So, um, in fact, you know, there's uh, ACOG, the American College of um, Obstetrics and Gynecologists, you know, did put out a statement saying that um, by having a doula, basically, uh, in that continuous labor support, has shown to reduce interventions and um, C-section birth rates. So uh, overall, I think providers are seeing the improved outcomes and, um, you know, the data supports it. Awesome. And and on the flip side, those partners that want to be super involved, they wish they were the ones having the labor. Um, they love having the doulas there too, because they don't really think we're there to take over for them. They want us to show them exactly what they need to be doing every step of the way. Uh, They're like, show me what to do. Show me what to do. So it's great for both, 
you know, set of partners, the really hands on ones and the ones that are scared and, and want to hide in a corner. Right. Oh, yeah, and they certainly do. And not all partners. I mean, there are certainly some that I want to recruit as doulas because they're fabulous. They just naturally kind of fall into that support role. But for others, it's really scary for them. Um, Maybe they've had, you know, a bad experience in a hospital setting before, or they've never been in that environment before. So um, often, you know, they shut down and they just don't know what to do. So we pull them up from the chair. We have them put their cell phone down, and we help to um, engage the two of them together and, and guide them, you know, through contractions and stuff and help them to set up an environment that's more relaxed for them. Now, that brings us to the Schwinkter Law. <laughs> Can you tell everybody <laughs> what the Schwinkter Law is? Oh, it's my favorite topic. So, of course. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you – Ina Mae Gaskin is a big name in the birth world, and she's an amazing midwife who has – a long history, and I'm not going to get into that so much, but um, there's a wonderful book that she put together called Ina May's Guide to Childbirth, and there's a chapter in there about the sphincter law, and often we see women, you know, in labor at home in their own space where it's comfortable and predictable. Everyone knows where their furniture and food's located and people and sounds and pets, and it's predictable, um, and they feel okay, so they're relaxed. So they're pumping out high levels of oxytocin, they're having great contractions, and they're moving along nicely. And then we scoop these women up and tell them to head into the hospital um, when it gets more uncomfortable, basically. Um, so you have, you have more pain, and you have now an unfamiliar space, and that's very anxiety-provoking for a lot of people. Um, so if you're able to you know, throw a doula into the picture, someone that is familiar to them um, in an unfamiliar space, it helps them to relax. And they're saying that, you know, sphincters don't respond to unfamiliar things. So the cervix, a sphincter, um, allows, you know, for opening when mom is more relaxed and not so stressed out and tense and anxious. And although the the nurses are fabulous and knowledgeable, um, a lot of times these women are just meeting them for the first time, um, you know, again, in an unfamiliar space, in an uncomfortable time for them. So, Um, so it's a great thing to be able to create a space where they can relax. And for some people that's, you know, stringing up, um, you know, Christmas lights in the room or having flowers or plants, uh, familiar sounds like you talked about with your music, right. That you used in the operating room, we incorporate music into the birth. Uh, and it's not always relaxation. You know, we hear hip hop and rock and I've had partners in there with guitars before. So, you know, that's drawn a crowd. So, it's music, it's clothing, it's using the water and utilizing the tools that are available to them um, to create a safe space to labor in so that they can progress because stress hormones always win. So if you're that mom that's curled up in the bed and her hands are like fists and she's so anxious, that's just going to slow everything right down. Um, Worst place to be is in the bed. We want them up moving. Yeah, and and a lot of people assume, us being, you know, those hypothetically crunchy doulas, that when we mean relaxation, um, that we mean that, you know, twinkle, twinkle, meditation music. But it really is whatever is relaxing to them, whatever smell is relaxing to them. Um, So if they hate lavender, we're not bringing the lavender. If, you know, they prefer, you know. on the job training. Yep. Right. If, if they want to swing their hips to, you know, the rapper Eminem while pushing out their baby, hell yeah, we're going to dance with them. Right. So exactly. And um, I've seen that. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it, it is the experience that they want to have. And, and we really just try to almost ensure that we can do it to the best of our ability with the situation that we're given. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Now, when it comes to birth plans. I'm not a fan. (laughs) Um, And as you said earlier, you know, keep them short. So what should be on a birth plan? If a mom walks up to you and gives you like, oh, hi, Tara, welcome. Here's our two or three page birth plan. Like, do you sit down with them and say, all right, let's get the Sharpie out? (laughs) Immediately, because here's the thing. Um, If you need that much control over your labor and you don't have that enough trust in your providers that are working with you, that it needs to be three to five pages double-sided and I've seen typed up and laminated and that's no joke. No, I've seen that too. And bullet Um, points. (laughs) Yeah. Not, not okay. Here's why, because first of all, no one's going to read that. Okay. It needs to be like one page with a list of the most important things 
Um, it shouldn't be confrontational. It should be things that, like typical things that would be nice to see on there would be a few sections, even if a mom's planning an unmedicated birth, but a few sections in there in the event of an epidural, in the event of a C-section, in the event my baby gets separated from me, just so there's the backup plan. Um, if you think about like the laboring piece, it may be stuff about getting out in movement in the hall and having access to the mobile monitors that are available. If it's medically okay to do that, sometimes it's not. Um, it may be that there's a pushing preference when she moves through stage two. Maybe she wants to labor down. Maybe she wants to squat to push, which we know is um, is a nice eviction notice for the baby. So, yeah. you know, we have that piece. We have the immediate uh, postpartum piece that may be listed in a birth plan, preferences, um, cord clamping, et cetera. So uh, short to the point, not confrontational, but most of all flexible. These people cannot be rigid um, with their ideas or they're going to be very disappointed. Right. Thanks for that, Tara. It's time for another break here at BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Stacey Bunyar, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Jenny Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexologist, commonly known as a sex therapist, with over 30 years of experience in the field of sexuality. She's been a researcher and teacher and is further trained in human development over the lifespan. She's also a published author and a radio personality. Her specialized training in lifespan developments means she can help individuals, couples, and families through difficult developmental phases. Her primary ways of working are through the tools of cognitive, behavioral, and psychoenergetics theories and techniques. Couples, individual men and women, and families are also welcome. She can meet in her office in Costa Mesa, California, or on the Internet through Skype at Jenny Friend MFT. Call 714-210-9200. You can also send an email from her website at www.centerforclarity.org. That phone number again is 714-210-9200. Baby Beginnings is back. I'm your host, Stacey Bunyar, and you are tuned in to BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Uh, last week, we talked about infant loss, and there are plenty of times where doulas are hired to support high-risk pregnancies and births. Um, tell our listeners what that kind of support looks like. So that support may look very different in, in many different uh, parts of the country, but I can tell you that, um, as I mentioned with Birthing Gently, we have a strong group of doulas um, who are experienced working with high-risk women, and I think we've really become uh, labeled sort of the high-risk birth doula practice um, in the area. And we work pretty closely at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass General Hospital uh, with maternal fetal medicine and a lot of their patients. So it may be that... A mother is considered high risk for advanced maternal age. It could be that a mother is considered high risk for a brain tumor or a cancer or heart disease or something like that. Or we might be working with a healthy mother who has an infant with a congenital heart disease or um, some kind of, um, you know, high risk medical condition that exists. And their baby is going to be transferred uh, from, you know, that birth right over to either a NICU in that hospital or maybe over to a children's hospital. So you have, you know, not only the birth of the baby, but now you're dealing with a mother and a, a partner and a family who's been separated from the baby. And that really changes things uh, from a support level uh, quite a bit. Um, and so these high-risk doulas are familiar with many of these medical conditions and 
the sort of the logistics of how these babies are transferred and making sure these moms are supported. So the care changes um, earlier when I had mentioned that a doula typically stays maybe two hours after the birth um, to help support mom with breastfeeding. In a situation where the baby is separated from the mom or if there's a loss, let's say, then the doula typically stays much longer than that um, to support the family and making sure that mom is um, getting her needs met as best as possible. So it's a different, um, it's a whole different uh, system when you're talking about high-risk doulas. Uh, we also have a group um, of volunteer birth doulas that work with a lot of uh, at-risk patients um, who are unable to afford a doula um, and cannot pay for that. So we have two different programs going. Um, that one, that volunteer birth doula program for high-risk people is at Mass General, and those are typically for very young mothers who would otherwise be by themselves in labor. So we have a lot going on um, and encouraging either pumping right after delivery might be something that we would work with the family if the mother can't breastfeed, uh, making sure pictures are taken, sitting with the families, um, talking through you know, the obstacles and, and things like that. So it's, a, it's definitely more emotionally challenging to deal with the high-risk population. And if you're in a situation where the baby does get transferred away, um, having a doula there kind of eases that tug-of-war situation for the partner of, do I go with the baby? Do I stay with my wife? Um, so the doula stays behind with the mom and usually the partner goes ahead with the baby. Is that how that goes? In my experience, yes. There's certainly been times though when the partner has wanted to stay with mom and they've asked me to go to the baby. So sometimes I'm with the baby at the NICU or I'm with the baby over at um, like the children's hospital or something like that. But I would say for the most part, yes, that, that the doula remains with the mom and the partner typically goes with um, with the baby. And, you know, we're texting updates or sending photos back and forth um, along with the, you know, the medical staff doing um, updates. But um, yeah, the doula typically does, uh, you know, stay there with the mother. And we try to normalize things the best that we can um, for them and try to make it a safe uh, experience and an emotionally, um, you know, satisfying experience the best that we can given the circumstances. How important is self-advocacy, regardless if you want a natural birth or you're in a high-risk birth situation? Super important, and I think that um, many moms don't um, listen to their intuition enough. One acronym that we use a lot uh, in the birth process for advocacy is, um, is BRAIN. So, for example, if an intervention is uh, suggested, perhaps, you know, asking that first question of B, of what are the benefits? Um, R is what are the risks? A is, is, are there any alternatives that we can look at here? I is intuition. And the last one, N, is what if we do nothing right now? So advocacy is huge, and I think it's okay for, for a mom to, to say, look, hold on, I don't understand what you're saying here, and explain it to me again, or explain it to me in a different way, or have somebody else explain to me what's going on. And not, and not feel bad about, you know, speaking up and asking questions. It's huge. And I, I wish more women would do this. Um, as a doula, we can't speak for them. We can only help to encourage these conversations. But in the moment, they really need to be making um, informed choices. And sometimes that means explaining things, you know, several times. Um, people tend to bounce between medical terms a lot and lay terms, and that can get really overwhelming and very confusing for people. Um, so advocacy is huge. Don't feel bad about it. And always go with your gut. Always go with your instincts. Excellent. Um, and it's also really important, as you mentioned, the doulas are not going to advocate for you. But during our prenatal uh, visits and our, our prenatal education, um, we have a chance to get on the same page as the moms. Um, so when we are in a situation where you know the mom didn't want something, you can say to her, I, I remember when we met, um, you didn't feel like this is something you wanted. Do you want a chance to talk about that or do you want to continue forward? Um, so we can remind them that there were steps that they wanted um, so that they can advocate for the, themselves, correct? Absolutely, right? and it could be from something very small to something pretty intense. So, for example, 
um, we come up at a prenatal visit with a code word. If a mom is having, I use code words differently, I think, than most doulas, but um, if a mom is having a lot of people in the room with her labor, so friends and family, we use a code word. If she uses it, I get the nurse, and the nurse comes in and clears out the room. Sometimes it's to remove too many visitors. Um, so that's a, a piece of advocacy, but sort of in a sneaky way. Um, but then we talk about, like, medical interventions, you know. Um, did we talk about um, her pushing preference, let's say, being pushing? I might look at the mom and say, remember you wanted to try to push. Remember we talked about this. Um, so reminding her of her birth preferences previously because they get so overwhelmed in the moment, it can just be too much for them to kind of recall what we discussed. Okay, we are heading to our last break on Baby Beginnings today here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is Stacey Bunyard. Sit tight. Horses, mystical, present, past, and future, all in one. Wild, free, domestic, and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted. And every 10 minutes, a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope. There is help. There is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing. And it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be. Healed. Hopeful. Happy. This is your host, Stacey Bunyar, and we are back on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. You're listening live to Baby Beginnings. Now, when it comes to paying for doulas here in Massachusetts, insurance doesn't pay for birth doulas as of yet, though hopefully soon. Um, Tufts Together Plan does pay for antepartum and postpartum doula services here in Mass. And some companies do allow flex spending to be used for your doula services. Um, Tara, what are some other ways parents can afford a doula? So there are some doulas that offer their, um, you know, their rate at more of like a sliding scale. Um, to help accommodate maybe uh, people that uh, couldn't afford, you know, a doula service um, for the full rate, let's say. So there is a range, and and people should shop around and see what makes most sense to them. Obviously, uh, we tend to see that less experienced doulas charge less. More experienced doulas typically are the higher rate um, going in the area. And we often encourage families, if you're doing a baby shower or a gift, a registry gifts that this might be something to put on there and something to think about, maybe birth doula services or postpartum doula services. Um, but it's certainly, you know, given the, the cost, it's certainly worth it giving, uh, you know, if you look at the outcomes, a much better with a doula. So um, we do encourage uh, families to all kind of pitch in and help if, if this is something that's important to them. Right. And parents, if you know you're going to want a doula ahead of time, right off the bat, you can start putting $100 a month away. And so that way, when it's time, um, it's not as aggressive. But it is so important for parents to know that they can register for services um, when they have a baby shower or something like that. And I can't tell parents enough, please get services. <laughs> like You'll be I mean, so look, grateful later. What? 
Stacy, what are they paying yeah. for a high-end stroller? A high. Oh you my God! I, mean? I yeah, some of it's just okay, crazy so, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is and actually this, um, this is actually going to help you as far as like you know birth outcome. Look at the C-section rates: different, lower birth satisfaction. Um, you know, induction rates, all of it. So this helps you um, physically. You know, get get out there and, and start putting some money away for doula services. Absolutely. I want a doula. I want a life doula. I wish somebody would help me with that. Uh, everyone needs a doula. I completely agree with that. Um, before we go, give us a quote that inspires you. A quote that inspires me. I would say... Never stop asking questions when, it, especially in a medical system or an institution, um, just keep asking questions, keep moving forward. If you're afraid, push through it, and hopefully, you know, you have a doula by your side that's able to guide you. But just never stop asking questions. Excellent. And what are obstacles that doulas face um, going into this? Are, are there obstacles for the doula? Um, I would say that the biggest obstacle for most doulas, um, you know, even teaching new doulas, we all kind of come up with the same thing. It's navigating, um, you know, child care, work, if they have another job. Some do this strictly as career. But trying to navigate the it's time to go now, the very last minute. You never know when you're really going. You never know really when you're coming home. So trying to, to reschedule appointments, find child care, and trying to have support systems in place in advance, you really have to do that um, in your life. And it can be tricky. It certainly is yeah. not impossible. I mean, I do it with five kids in a business, so you can you can do it. Um, but I think just uh, balancing life, it can be very challenging sometimes. And I'm sure you can speak to that too. Yes. Okay. Well, that is all the time we have today. I would like to thank Tara Campbell from Birthing Gently for coming on our show. You can look her up at www.birthinggently.com. Also, if she doesn't serve your area, you can go to www.doulamatch.com to find a doula that does serve your area. I'm your host, Stacey Bunyar, owner of Baby Beginnings New England. Come check us out at babybeginningsne.com. Thank you for tuning in on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. See you next week. You've been listening to Baby Beginnings with your host, Stacy Bunyar. Tune in each week as Stacy will guide you in making better and informed decisions regarding you, your baby, and your family. Here on Stacy Bunyar's Baby Beginnings. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.